Colin Tyler, a schoolteacher, is accused of indecent assault upon one of his pupils on August the 25th last year. The boy, Kevin Anderson, who is now 16, was in his history class at Greenacres Comprehensive School. Colin Tyler has elected to conduct his own defence and is calling, as a character witness, Ernest Baldwin, head of the history department at the school, and Colin Tyler has worked as his deputy since he left training college. Mr Baldwin, how long have you known me? Eight years. Now, in that eight years, have you ever had cause to suspect that my relationships with the pupils could be characterised by anything other than the utmost propriety? None at all, no. I've always considered you to be an exemplary teacher. And I've always found the way you conducted yourself towards children to be wise, mature and correct. Now, will you tell the court if you formed any impression of the boy Kevin Anderson? Yes, I did. Yes, it, it, it seemed to me that he was a boy of uh, above average ability from a background which was not, I felt, calculated to allow him to develop to the full his intellectual ability. He, he obviously clamoured for attention and he spent a great deal of his time trying to ingratiate himself with male members of staff. Well, perhaps ingratiate is, is too strong a word. He, he had great needs which were clearly unrecognised. He sought attention. He was emotionally immature. Now, do you remember a conversation that we had in October 1974, as a result of which it was suggested that I should counsel the boy, since it seemed that he had already made a confidant of me? Yes, I do indeed. From whom did that suggestion come, please? Oh, I made the suggestion with the concurrence of the headmaster. And what reasons prompted you to make that suggestion? Well, I felt there was a danger of the boy becoming a drifter. He was inclined to be rather emotional and he was conspicuously overcompensating with some of his fellow pupils. He was not popular. No, he had what seemed to me a terrible need for approval and didn't seem to know how to achieve it. Now, do you know if his mother was informed of the school's concern? Oh, yes, by letter. Do you know what her reply was? Oh, she made no reply. Well, this meant, of course, that we were unable to refer him to an outside agency such as Child Guidance. But it was agreed that if he chose to talk to you, then you should make it clear that you were available. And did you notice a change in the boy's behaviour over time? Yes, he appeared to become more self-reliant, partly due, I must confess, to the natural processes of maturation, but also, partly, I am convinced to the beneficent influences under which he came. Now, Mr Baldwin, were you aware of the extramural activities that I undertook in the evenings and during school holidays? Oh, indeed I was, yes, and very grateful I was to you that you should do so. Thank you, Mr Baldwin. Yes, Mr Baldwin. Now, uh, would it have been possible for Mr Tyler to give you the impression that he was acting altruistically and yet at the same time to have behaved in a very different way with the boy himself? Now that would have required a duplicity which is not in Mr. Tyler's character. But would it have been possible? It would, but it was not probable. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Do you know Mr. Tyler socially? Oh, yes, yes. He's been to my house on a number of occasions for dinner with my family. We once went to the theatre together. Oh, well, did you know that he regularly visited a pub called the uh, Greyhound? No. Isn't there, then, a large part of his life about which you know absolutely nothing? In some areas, yes. Did you know he was homosexual? Oh, yes. Really? Yes. And yet, you saw fit to suggest that he should counsel a 15-year-old boy. A boy whom you yourself have described as being over-emotional and who tried to ingratiate himself with male members of staff? Yes, sir, I did. I had and had no reason to suppose that Mr Tyler's conduct would be anything other than properly professional. I feel it is a vulgar error to assume that homosexual teachers are more likely than their heterosexual counterparts to be attracted to their pupils. In fact, I would fear more for the potential danger to girl pupils from male teachers. And even this fear is so residual as to be of no consequence in one's daily business with other members of staff. You encouraged 
a homosexual to counsel an insecure boy. A boy uncertain of his identity and his role in the world. Yes, and I have no reason to be apprehensive about such a decision. How very unusual. I wonder how many of the parents of your pupils would share such latitudinarian views. Yes? Alas, sir, it is not possible for me to canvass opinions from everyone before carrying out decisions in connection with my professional duties. No, Mr. Tyler? No, no more questions, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. You may leave the witness box. Now then, Mr. Tyler, as you are conducting your own defence, which you have every right to do, there are now a number of courses open to you. You may remain absolutely silent, or you may make a statement from where you are without taking the oath, in which case you cannot be cross-examined, or... You may come to the witness box, be sworn, and give your evidence, which will then be subject to cross-examination by learned counsel for the prosecution. Can you tell me which course you propose to adopt? Yes, my lord. I wish to give evidence under oath. Very well. Now, I must advise you as to what you may and may not say. If I feel that you depart in any way from matters germane to the charge, I shall stop you. But on the other hand, if you feel uncertain about any matter of procedure, you must stop and ask me for guidance, which I shall give you. Now, try to give your evidence as simply and as succinctly as you can. I have never concealed from my peers the fact that I am homosexual. I did not divulge this to children. It does not seem to me to have any place in my professional relationships. And I have never favoured boys against girls. Very soon after Kevin came into my class, I became aware that I had kindled an interest in him. Now, this is not unusual. There are some children, albeit few and far between, who are emotionally disturbed or damaged and who are quite unaware of the clearest rejection of their instincts for affection and warm, caring relationships. Kevin Anderson was such a boy. Now, it was clear to many people, including senior staff, that what Kevin wanted was... Attention, not in an idle or casual way, but in a very determined and quite unusually desperate fashion which almost amounted to an obsession. It was at my insistence that he finished his relationship with Malcolm Harmon. This caused an unfortunate result in that it caused him to transfer his affections to me. He saw me every day at school. He began to lay in ambush for me. Now, I am not suggesting that he was implementing a self-conscious and carefully prepared plan. In every way, he was quite unaware of the implications of what he was doing. But I felt his eyes upon me, continually. I was not attracted to Kevin, but I did develop a fascination for his persistence. Now, I know this may seem fanciful to you, but the image that has been presented of me in this court as a calculating man abusing his position, is very far from the truth. It must not be forgotten that this boy, illegitimate, fatherless, endowed with an above-average intelligence, was born into a household that could afford him no stimulus to his intellect, no outlet for his emotions. Now, this does not mean that his mother was in any way blameworthy. She herself was faced with a situation of almost total despair. No resources, no support and three young, dependent children. She turned to Kevin for a help which he could not give. Can you imagine the desperation of a 15-year-old boy asked to provide the role of substitute father and emotional support to a mother when the very things that he himself needed were the support and authority of a father? Now, I thought that I might be able to provide some of the strength that he needed... Unfortunately, I overestimated my own morality and became deeply involved emotionally with Kevin. If such a relationship is improper, where does the impropriety lie? Is it better for a boy to wander the streets of a city alone than to be under the tutelage of a caring relationship which can provide warmth and stability? 
If this boy has been assaulted, it has been by circumstances. It has been by the pressures of a society that can offer only material goods as a substitute for human relationships. Now, I do not deny that I have benefited from providing him with some of the things he needed. But I do deny most vehemently that any part of my behaviour has anything to do with indecency. The true indecencies lie elsewhere. Yes, but the society is not on trial here today, Mr Tyler. I am aware that there are some aspects of this case which belong more to the area of morality than the law, but you must confine yourself to giving evidence in rebuttal of the offence for which you stand arraigned. I admit that I committed an act of folly in acceding to the boy's request to come back with me to the flat that night, but as soon as I realised my error of judgement, I tried to redeem it as best I could. Now, the court has heard that Kevin was upset... Indeed, he was upset, but he was upset long before he came back to the flat that night. He was upset on the very first day that I met him. Surely it is the act of an emotionally disturbed young man to hitchhike down the motorway alone looking for a pop festival on the very night that he alleges that I assaulted him. I deny that any such assault took place on that or on any other occasion, and I submit that the alleged assault is the construct of the imagination of a very lonely and a very unhappy boy. And that is all I have to say. Mr. Tyler... You admit, uh, of course, that your interest in the boy was sexual. Yes. And yet you allowed this relationship to flourish. I did not stop it. Well, would it not have been wiser, if you had known of your own potential weakness, to have truncated all but the most unavoidable professional contacts? No. Well, please explain, then, why you failed to adopt a course that most people would consider wiser in the circumstances. I felt that the consequences of adopting such a course would be more damaging to the boy than my continued interest in him. Yes, but could anything have been more damaging to a 15-year-old boy than to be taken off to the flat of a self-confessed homosexual, a sophisticated man, and there to be subjected to a wrestling match under the cloak of which that older man derived sexual gratification? It was not damaging. It did not happen. Did you seek to arouse the boy? No. But you did touch his private parts? Yes. No. Yes or no? Yes, but it was not deliberate. Mr Tyler, you were alone with a boy in a flat. You as a homosexual. The boy whom you admit to being interested in sexually. The boy had removed some of his clothing, which was at your suggestion. And you touched his private parts and you asked us to believe that that was unintentional. Yes, we were wrestling. Well, why would a man of 33 wrestle with a 15-year-old boy? We enjoyed each other's company. Yes, but apparently on this occasion, one of you didn't. Yes. Kevin was aware that your interest in him was sexual. Yes. Uh, why did you go back to the flat after you'd been to the fair? Kevin didn't want to go home. He wanted to come home with me. Well, on previous occasions, you say that you had refused to allow the boy into the flat, yet on this occasion you deemed the time was suitable. Yes. Suitable for what? For making sexual advances to him? No, he wanted to talk. Oh, he wanted to talk, I see. But but had you not had the whole day at the fair together to talk in? He wanted to talk quietly. You wanted to talk to him about sex? No. But you did talk about sex? Yes, a little. Why? Because Kevin wanted to talk about it. I never forbade Kevin to talk about anything he wanted to talk about. Mr Tyler, what you're asking us to accept is this that you developed a relationship with this boy which, quite frankly, was based upon sexual interest, and yet you altruistically refrained from expressing this interest until one day you just happened to be wrestling on a bed and you inadvertently touched his private parts and then you immediately desisted. That is what happened. On the night of November the 15th, 1974, you just happened to be standing outside the Wimpy Bar where Kevin was meeting Mr Harmon. No, I wasn't outside the Wimpy Bar by chance. Oh, why were you there then? I doubted Mr Harmon's resolution in breaking off his friendship with Kevin. But why did it concern you so closely that you felt it necessary to spy on that meeting? I wanted him to finish his friendship with Kevin. Why was that? 
Because I felt it was an embarrassment. To whom? To me. Yes, but why should you have been embarrassed? But was the friendship between Kevin and Mr. Harmon a sexual one? No. Well, then why should it be so important to you that their friendship should cease? I was his teacher and I was living with Mr. Harmon at the time. You were jealous? Yes, in a way. I did not want my private life to mix with my professional life. Yet you maintained an interest in this boy for a whole year while you were teaching him. Is not that allowing your professional and your private life to mix? I did not wish my relationship with Mr. Harmon, which was sexual, to have anything to do with my professional relationships with my children, which were not sexual. I see. Now, when you intervened in the meeting between Kevin and Mr. Harmon, why did you suggest you should go back to your flat? Well, it was a very tense situation, and I didn't think a wimpy bar was a private enough place for such a conversation. Now, how long did you remain together talking out the implications of this um, relationship? Well, about an hour. And then the boy left? Yes. Was the outcome of this discussion to your satisfaction? Yes. Well, does that mean, in effect, that the boy was to cease to be Mr. Harmon's friend and merely be your pupil? Yes. Did the boy know where you lived before you went back to the flat? Oh, no. Well, could Kevin have interpreted the invitation as a way of finding out where you lived? I don't think so. What happened the following night? He came again. He did, of course, by that time, know where you lived. Yes. How convenient. During this bout of wrestling on August the 25th, how did it come about that you found your way to the bed? Well, it was the most comfortable place. Comfortable for what? For wrestling. Did you wrestle as a means of establishing physical contact? It was a means of communicating. Of communicating sexually? No. Did you at any time remove any clothing? No. Did Kevin remove any clothing? No. Yes, of course he did. He took his shirt off. It was very warm in the flat. Mm. Why did the fighting stop? Kevin asked me to stop. To stop what? Putting your hands on his private parts? To stop fighting. But you did put your hands on his private parts. I may have done, but it was unintentional. Were you sexually aroused at the time? Yes, that's why I stopped. And the boy was aware of your state of sexual arousal? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. I have no further questions. My lord. Members of the jury. This man, Colin Tyler, a mature man of quite evidently great intelligence, not only failed to measure up to the standards that we require of his position, but also used that position, a position of great trust, to further his own sexual ends. He deliberately developed a relationship with a child in his care, part of which he himself has admitted was sexual. Now, we have heard how he became interested in the boy, how he became jealous of his own lover, how he took the boy back to his flat, how he invited the boy to remove some clothing, how he indulged in horseplay with the boy, and finally, how he touched the boy's private parts and rubbed himself against him. And this is a man who has advised the boy himself to avoid contacts with homosexuals because it could damage him psychologically. Now, Tyler has admitted that he was sexually interested in the boy. He has admitted that he was sexually aroused at the time. He has admitted that he touched the boy's private parts. He has admitted that the boy himself was distressed, and yet he claims that this touching was inadvertent. Now, surely the evidence can lead to only one conclusion, that this man is guilty of an indecent assault upon Kevin Anderson. Members of the jury, I have never sought to conceal that I was, and am, deeply concerned about a boy who lacked what all young people most need, care and affection. I concede that part of my interest was sexual, but that no part of my behaviour was at any time intentionally so. I submit that a lonely and unloved boy unwittingly tried to tempt me beyond the bounds of what is professionally permitted and on one occasion almost succeeded. But as soon as I realized what might happen, I did indeed desist. Not merely because it would be against the law, 
but because it would have given pain to someone whose welfare most deeply concerns me. That my actions were ill-advised, I concede. But I submit that there has been no evidence given by anyone in this court to indicate guilt of an offence punishable by law. You must, therefore, acquit me of this charge. No, John! Guilt! Put you in prison! Get your hands off! Oh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. If there is anyone else here minded to repeat behavior of that sort, let them be moved, that I shall regard it as a contempt of court. And members of the jury, you will, of course, realize that you mustn't allow yourselves to be affected by other people's prejudices. Now, <clears throat> members of the jury, the accused, as you know, is charged with indecent assault. That is, the deliberate touching of another person with indecent associations. The prosecution allege that the accused intentionally touched the private parts of the boy Kevin Anderson. Well, that, you may think, would amount to indecent assault. The accused claims that any such touching was unintentional, by accident, in which case, of course, plainly, he would not be guilty of indecent assault. That's what you've got to decide. That's all you're concerned with, really. The events of the August the 25th of last year at the accused flat. You are not directly concerned with whether or not the boy came from a caring home, whether or not the accused caused Mr. Harmon to leave his wife, though this background information may assist you in deciding whether or not someone had a reason for lying, someone had lied or misrepresented the facts. But what finally you must resolve is the conflict of evidence between the accused and the boy, Kevin Anderson. And you must beware of coming to the conclusion that as the accused has admitted that he is a homosexual, he would be incapable of restraining himself from taking advantage of the boy. The one thing doesn't necessarily follow the other. But if you believe the evidence of Kevin Anderson, then in this case you must come to the conclusion that the accused did take advantage of the boy and you must convict. Remember? The prosecution must prove their case to your entire satisfaction. If they fail to do so, then you will return a verdict of not guilty. Will you now please retire? Elect a foreman to speak for you on your return and consider your verdict. Members of the jury, will your foreman please rise? I'll just answer the question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict to which you're all agreed? Yes. Do you find the defendant, Colin Tyler, guilty or not guilty on the charge of indecent assault? Not guilty. Well, Mr. Tyler, you are discharged. Free to leave the court. The cases in Fulchester Crown Court are fictional, but the jury is made up of members of the public. Car cameras will return to bring you another leading case in the Crown Court. <laughs>